Ladies, gentlemen, brethren, companions, good evening and welcome. We are live across the UK, indeed the world, for this evening's Solomon Live. I'm Brody. I'm the Provincial Communications Officer for Worcestershire, and I have the, the wonderful job and, dare I say, the honour of hosting these monthly webinars of lively Freemasonry conversation. And you can, you can submit your questions to our special guest this evening via the question and answer facility at the bottom of the screen. And as I alluded to just a few minutes ago, but perhaps you, you missed this as you were joining us, uh, we're conducting a poll this evening, and that poll simply is asking you the question, are you a member of Royal Arch? And our topic this evening is mysteries of the Royal Arch. And I'm delighted to tell you our special guest this evening is third grand principal, most excellent companion, Gareth Jones, OB, Gareth, how are you? You okay? Very good, Brody. Very good. Now, um, what I thought we could do, we're, obviously we're here to talk about Royal Arch this evening and uh, the history and where we are today with Royal Arch, but I thought we could get to know you a little bit better, if, if that's okay. So I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you, why did you join Royal Arch in the first place? Because we've all got our unique stories, haven't we? Yeah, it's a fairly sort of prosaic story in my case. Um, I had joined Freemasonry along with my, my brother in, in uh, the early 1980s. Um, we had gone through our first, second and third degrees and uh, some time shortly after that, uh, somebody from within the lodge said, well, you Jones brothers, you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the Royal Arch, uh, come and join uh, this chapter of ours. Um, the, uh, the individuals who, who invited us to do so uh, were people that we liked and we trusted and uh, we thought would, uh, we would enjoy their, their company. And they told us that, that we would most definitely enjoy uh, the Royal Arch and that we would make a broader circle of friends uh, of individuals that were members of the chapter that, that weren't from our lodge. Um, and so uh, we joined. I, I suppose we were a bit flattered to be asked, frankly. Um, and and we, we joined a chapter in Cardiff called the Shamvaya chapter, um, uh, very strongly linked to rugby union. And uh, uh, we never looked back, really. We're both still members there now. Oh, that's a, that's a lovely story, isn't it? And what is it that you personally enjoy about Royal Arch? What is it, what is it you, you like about chapter? I suppose the Royal Arch for me is, um, it, it's a very colorful uh, ceremony. It's a very beautiful ceremony. Um, it's a ceremony that has very rich ceremonial, very rich language uh, is used in it. Um, I love the story uh, that's associated with, with the Royal Arch. Um, and I love uh, sitting and listening or indeed taking part in um, you know something that 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 uh, that is so enjoyable and and so rich in its uh, in its meaning. And could you have ever imagined when you joined back in the day that you would ever be the grand principal? <laughs> good, good God, no. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't suppose I knew what on earth a third grand principal was uh, at the time. Um, and like like everybody at that stage of, of one's journey in in masonry. Um, I was I was sort of reluctant to to even talk to more senior members of of the uh, of the chapter and certainly more senior members within the province. Um, some of whom, you know, I have to say, in those days, were not terribly approachable. Um, and uh, so the whole the whole idea of of um, even going through the three chairs in the Royal Arch and then. And then going on to represent the province in the way that I did was was just it just wasn't on the agenda really. Um, I joined to enjoy it. I enjoyed it very much. I went through all the various offices of of the chapter, and have since done so in in several other chapters too. Um, and uh, like with most people, I suppose um, offices, offers of jobs, offers of roles in in more senior um, arenas just came along. Well, it's a lovely story and, and I can't begin to imagine how happy and honored you feel to have the role that you have. But let's let's talk about Royal Arch in, uh, in a little bit more detail. So um, a lot of people ask this question, why don't we call it the completion 
of Freemasonry anymore. What, what, why, why did that change? Yeah, we we used to call it the completion of the third degree, really, didn't we? And and um, I think it was determined rightly that to call it the completion of anything uh, was to suggest that those that had not taken that step were not in some way complete. Um, we're taught, aren't we, that when we when we join Freemasonry, that once we're initiated into Freemasonry, we are then Masons. We are then complete Masons, in fact. Uh, and the fact that we, most of us, go on then to do um, further degrees in the craft, uh, and some of us then go on to join other orders, in particular the, the Royal Arch, um, is, is a matter of choice. Um, so I wouldn't want us to go back to suggesting that people were in some way incomplete if they had not joined the Royal Arch. I like to uh, characterize it as the culmination of our journey in pure and ancient Freemasonry. And I think that uh, characterizing it in that way um, reflects correctly the way that it's set out in the Book of Constitutions and reflects correctly the way in which um, the First Grand Principle, for example, uh, describes how he thinks people ought to uh, approach their, their joining of the, the Royal Arch. So let's talk about, let's talk about the relationship between chapter and craft degrees. Perhaps you could explain a bit more on that for us. Yeah, I mean, I see the whole thing as, as uh, a, a, a journey, uh, frankly. Um, let, let's take a, a little step back, first of all, and think about the meaning of the craft degrees. Um, we're taught, aren't we, in, in the three degrees of the craft, uh, that they are about uh, birth, uh, our entrance into this world, going from darkness to light. Um, they, uh, the second degree talks about our life and our development and our learning through life hidden mysteries of nature and science as we as we know it. The third degree talks about and teaches us of our mortality. It uh, teaches us that uh, we've only got one shot at this life and that we uh, ought to behave in a certain way uh, and that eventually uh, mortality will catch up with, with all of us. The third degree also teaches us that there's something missing, that we, we lose something as uh, at the end of the story. And there is something missing in our lives if we're only thinking about mortal things. And for me, the, the Royal Arch is that next, that next step, something spiritual, um, something to do with our relationship with, with our God. Um, which fills that gap, if you like, it's the final piece in that that jigsaw. There's a there's a beautiful piece of ritual, Brody, which is not um, not terribly well known um, in the Royal Arch, but which talks about the high calling of a Royal Arch Mason, which teaches us to look beyond the high moral and social duties of of a craft Mason to our duty to and our relationship with God. And that little bit of ritual, which is in, in the explanation of the Royal Arch certificate, um, for me, encapsulates that final piece of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like. So birth, life, death, and that spiritual relationship with, with our God. Would you, like, would you like a Freemason to know that before? they become a companion or learn that once once they join Royal Arch? I think there's something nice and impactful about it becoming known as part of one's journey. Absolutely. Um, I certainly think that um, we should be introducing our candidates to the concept of a four-stage process in, in Freemasonry uh, when we first meet them, uh, before they even uh, are initiated into their lodges so that they they understand that there is a four-stage process. None of this, of course, is compulsory. Um, 
once somebody has done their first degree, there's nothing compulsory after that. And, and you know, I'm often asked, should we make uh, joining the Royal Arch compulsory? Should we make it uh, an absolutely essential step? And my answer to that, Brody, is always, well, I'm not sure we should make anything compulsory in Freemasonry, actually. It's, it's, it's supposed to be fun. Uh, we joined it because we, uh, we think we'll enjoy it. And as we journey through the various stages of Freemasonry, I, I hope that that is confirmed in, in, uh, in the way that we do enjoy it. Uh, and so making things compulsory for me isn't the way to do it. It's making things attractive so that people actually want to join and want to get involved and then want to be properly engaged in, in everything we do. Uh, that for me is, is, the, is the answer. Absolutely. Now let's let's uh, focus um, on the the history once again of Royal Arch. Uh, we have a United Crown Lodge, no, we? Why don't we have a United Crown Chapter? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. And you know, one answer to that is that we did have a United Grand Chapter, but I, I, I'll I'll come on to that. Um, we've got a United Grand Lodge because we had two separate Grand Lodges that joined together and united and became the United Grand Lodge. There have never been two separate uh, grand chapters that got together and, and united to become a United Grand Chapter. You have to look back at the, the history of early Freemasonry to, to really understand why we've got this, uh, this slightly strange compromise that we, that we now live with. The Premier Grand Lodge, the so-called Moderns, uh, which was established in 1717, um, really didn't have very much to do with Royal Arch Masonry at all until the advent uh, of the Ancients uh, in the 1750s. The Ancients, of course, were, were established uh, by Irish Freemasons and uh, they worked Royal Arch ritual as part of the craft ceremonies. It was a fourth degree. It was effectively a fourth degree uh, in, in Freemasonry. So as we move towards um, the 1813 um, unification uh, of the Grand Lodges, uniting of the two Grand Lodges, uh, there was clearly going to be a problem here with the Royal Arch. The moderns, the original Grand Lodge, uh, really uh, had nothing to do with the Royal Arch, certainly wouldn't allow it to be practiced in their ceremonies. Um, the ancients, the, the, uh, the newer uh, Grand Lodge, so-called ancients, I know that sounds a bit strange to people, but the ancients was the, was the newer uh, Grand Lodge, were working the Royal Arch as a fourth degree, and so in coming up with some wording to describe how the Royal Arch would um, uh, integrate with, uh, the, uh, with craft uh, was clearly going to require some compromise. That's why um, the preliminary declaration that we've now got in the Book of Constitutions is written as it is, um, which says that uh, pure ancient masonry consists of three degrees and three degrees only. The entered apprentice, the fellow craft, master mason, including the supreme order of the Holy Royal Arch. There is a school of thought, I think a pretty well evidenced school of thought, that um, suggests that the original wording of that declaration uh, was going to talk about a fourth degree including the fourth degree of uh, the, the Royal Arch. Uh, but the, um, uh, the moderns under the Duke of Sussex clearly wouldn't want that. And so they came up with the wording that we, we now have, um, which as far as I'm aware is, is pretty unique uh, across the world. Um, neatly described by uh, some as the, the Sussex fudge, uh, of course, um, but it works. And we've uh, lived with it now for well over 200 years, and uh, I see no reason why it shouldn't last for a lot longer. 
Well, it's the old saying, isn't it, Gareth? If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's, it's certainly, uh, it certainly isn't broken. And, um, and whilst we're talking about the history, a lot of people would like to know this, uh, this question. Why did we wear the sash over the left shoulder and not the right shoulder like other progressive orders? Because this seems to be a question that a lot of people would like to get the answer to. That's a very good question. And um, I bet I'm not alone in uh, having seen quite a lot of companions wear their sash over the wrong shoulder. Oh, absolutely. Including, including some pretty senior companions, I have to tell you. <laughs> As part of the uh, symbolism within our chapters, uh, everybody who is a member of the Royal Arch will know that we have on the floor of the chapter uh, the sword and the trowel. Uh, they represent uh, the work of those worthy masons who were rebuilding the second temple at Jerusalem with a trowel uh, in one hand and their sword ever at the ready to defend themselves from uh, potential attackers. Um, the reason we wear the sash over our left shoulder is so that the sword can be easily accessible with the left hand uh, while uh, working with the trowel with the right hand. Brilliant. I guarantee we're doing a poll, of course, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, companions, uh, asking you the question uh, this evening, are you a member of Royal Arch? And I almost guarantee there's a lot of members of, uh, of Royal Arch who didn't know the answer to that. So thank you very much indeed. Now let's, let's talk about Royal Arch today, if that's okay, Gareth. Uh, what do members get out of being a member of Royal Arch and Chapter? Because we've got a lot of progressive orders. Uh, what do members get out of being a member of Chapter? Well, the first thing they get out of it is, is as we've already described, they, they, they get to complete their journey in pure ancient masonry. They get that final missing piece of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like, which describes and characterizes their, their lives. But I'm not naive enough to believe that, um, you know, everybody thinks about the Royal Arch or indeed their masonry in general, uh, in terms of the, its philosophical meaning or its spiritual um, uh, uh, meanings either. The vast majority of people uh, get out of Freemasonry and Royal Arch masonry um, enjoyment, fun, friendships, um, and that's fine. Uh, you know, people join masonry and people join Royal Arch masonry for a whole wide variety of reasons, all of which, for me, um, seem to be perfectly legitimate. What I get out of uh, Royal Arch Masonry and what I think most people will get out of Royal Arch Masonry when they join it um, is that wow factor. You know, they've been through their three degrees in, in the craft. Um, they then join something that is that looks very different, is very impactful. Um, I don't know anybody who's joined that hasn't said um, it really did give them the wow factor when they did join. Um, and then, of course, once they've joined, they get the opportunity, and I hope more and more opportunities these days, to participate in some absolutely beautiful ritual which describes uh, a most interesting and colourful story. So, you know, it, 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 it provides a huge amount of, of enjoyment for people. I know that um, there are lots of other orders. Indeed, I'm a member of many other orders, um, all of which provide their own particular brand of, of enjoyment and their own uh, you know, particular elements that, that perhaps other orders don't have, different bits of stories, different chronologies. Um, but for me, the Royal Arch has that something extra. Yeah. It's not just me saying this, of course, um, uh, the, the first Grand Principal made it very clear um, a couple of years ago at a, at a quarterly communication um, that it was his view that brethren should join the Royal Arch after joining the craft before they consider joining any other orders. And I tend to use that as a, um, as a suggested uh, way forward for people. 
that's not in any way to suggest that people should not join other orders. Um, I've had lots of fun in other orders as well, and I'm sure uh, others do as well. It's, it's one of those things, isn't it, Gareth, that a, a, um, a Freemason does what's right for them at the time, isn't it, and, uh, and, and to go into that direction. But let's talk about the, uh, the work that goes on um, in, uh, in Royal Arch. Is sharing working chapters important, do you think? Oh, absolutely essential. Um, I mean, for, for two reasons, really, or maybe three reasons. Um, first of all, um, it's the best way uh, to engage members is to give them a bit of work to do. I, I often say when I, when I visit provinces and, uh, and districts and, and chapters and, and give little presentations that, you know, one can easily see how during um, an exaltation meeting, a meeting uh, bringing a, a member into the Royal Arch, that at least 14 members can take quite a significant part in undertaking that, that exaltation. That engages at least 14 members and maybe brings along some of them that, that wouldn't have bothered to come otherwise. Um, so it's a good way of engaging members. Secondly, um, it's a good way of injecting variety into a, a, a piece of ceremony. Um, we've all sat through uh, ceremonies over the years, haven't we, where um, the the, the the deliverer of the ritual uh, who has done rather too much of it um you know tends to become slightly monotonous whereas just having that different that different voice um delivering some of the ritual is is for me very important it's important for the visitors uh, and the members to listen to but it's particularly important for the most important person there on that evening and that's the candidate who needs to be uh, stimulated and needs to be engaged and needs to be interested uh, throughout the, the proceedings. Gareth, we've got so much to get through, and uh, but I think it's important that we get to uh, one of our questions that we've, uh, we've kindly had sent in. Um, and obviously we, we can only say so much naturally. Uh, what is your favorite portion of Royal Arch ritual and why? So uh, quite a difficult one to answer when we can't really answer it. Um, well, it's quite an easy bit for me to answer. I, I've done all. I've done all the uh, the offices, um, but um, it's got to be the principal sojourner's role. Um, the the role of the individual who takes the candidate through the story uh, of the evening, uh, who acts out uh, on behalf of the the, the candidate. Um, all of the uh, all of the drama uh, of the evening, uh, for me, that's uh, that's the the most the most stimulating and difficult, uh, but most satisfying uh, bit of ritual. I mentioned a, a little bit of ritual earlier on, actually, which is the um, the explanation of the Royal Arts Certificate. It's not heard very often in uh, in chapters these days, um, but I would encourage chapters to do it because um, it really does encapsulate what the Royal Arch is all about. It explains a little bit about um, you know why uh, we consider the Royal Arch uh, to be about our relationship with and our duty to our God. No, it's, 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 uh, it's wonderful to hear you um, to, to hear you give your opinions on what really moves you in the uh, in the world of Royal Arch ritual. Um, so let's let's talk about the world that we live in right now. COVID nineteen, it's it's affected everybody. What are you uh, What are you doing to uh, to help members with uh, with Royal Arch and to to retain them during this difficult time? Yeah, this is this is um, of course uh, some concern. Um, I talk I have talked a lot uh, over the last um, couple of months to grand superintendents across. Uh, England and Wales, and indeed to district grand superintendents ac across the world, about what they are doing to to try and engage not just their members but their potential members. We we must remember that when the pandemic struck last year, um, all chapters, all provinces, all districts will have had 
the number of potential candidates in waiting. Um, and it seems to me, uh, and from the discussions I've had with them, I think the leaders of, of, uh, of our provinces and districts agree that it has been absolutely essential to keep in touch with those potential candidates so that they don't frankly lose interest and so that they see that there are companions who are interested in their joining and are trying to keep them engaged despite the fact um, that we haven't been able yet to, to exalt them. Um, just about all grand superintendents I've spoken to have said that they've got lists of the numbers of, of people that are waiting and they've also been encouraging their chapters, their individual chapters, to keep in touch with them in the same way that lodges have been keeping in touch with prospective candidates for the craft. Um, so, you know, it works, it works for both orders. We need to uh, continue to engage people. Um, and once we get the go ahead uh, that we can restart our meetings with exaltations, of course, some meetings are happening already, uh, but without uh, exalting candidates, once we get the go ahead, I hope that chapters will do their very best to, to get on and do whatever is necessary to bring in those candidates that have been waiting rather too long uh, to join. And that for me includes uh, having emergency meetings where necessary, doing multiple ceremonies. I have never uh, been someone who has believed uh, that we should not do multiple ceremonies. I think we I think they work perfectly well. Um, I myself was exalted, as I said earlier, with, with my brother in a double ceremony. Um, and, you know, I have uh, presided over multiple ceremonies of up to four or five candidates. Wow. And, you know, it works well, as long as you practice it and you have enough people to help you out. And uh, back to uh, the questions, Gareth, are there any particular efforts being made uh, to attract younger brethren? To, uh, to join um, Royal Arch, because uh, obviously we need to keep our candidates engaged who are potentially looking to join. But, uh, but what about the younger membership? Yeah, I mean, the, the, clearly there's a lot of effort being put into trying to attack, attract younger members to the craft, and that will eventually feed through into younger people joining uh, the Royal Arch. Um, I know that uh, there are a number of universities chapters that have uh, have sprung up over the last uh, couple of years um, and there is at least one uh, new and young masons club chapter um, which i uh, happen to know very well because i was at primus first principal um, not because i consider myself a new and young mason uh, but because uh, i was the president of the club that uh, set up that chapter so there are a number of, of things going on. I think the important thing um, is that we uh, try to secure our membership from the craft from right across the spectrum. You know, I, I, we often forget uh, older members too, uh, who are craft members and perhaps have been craft members for a long time. Um, and I constantly say to, to grand superintendents, you know, don't don't forget them. There are some members who perhaps were asked to join the Royal Arch many years ago and for whatever reason felt they couldn't at the time because of work commitments or family commitments. Um, and quite often we forget about them and we don't ask them again. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that we, um, we do our best uh, to try and engage and, and, and uh, attract members from right across the spectrum uh, in the craft. It's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I, I think you're right. It, it, it could often be a case of, oh, that ship has sailed, but maybe, maybe it hasn't sailed, or maybe it's worth asking that question as well. And, um, and let's talk about um, themed and special chapters now, because we, we've got a lot of those in the world of craft, haven't we? Do you think there's room for, for those in the world of chapter? Um, I'm not a huge fan of themed chapters for their own sake. I do think, however, that themed lodges are a good idea. And I also think that establishing chapters 
attached to those themed lodges um, is also a good idea. So, you, you know, we would end up with having themed chapters, but as a result of their links with uh, themed lodges, for example. Um, so I'm not sure that um, establishing themed chapters as a separate entity um, is necessarily going to to catch on. Uh, but I do, but I, as I say, I do think that uh, they they could well, in fact, they already have um, uh, come into existence as a result of their links with uh, with the lodges that that uh, that sponsored them. And, and let's talk about um, membership again. Should members of Royal Arch advertise their membership the same way that we're urged to do as craft masons? Or do you think the uh, the outside world would perhaps find that a little bit confusing? Because after all. Uh, most non-Masons uh, understand it's craft masonry, and that's and that's about it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, to, uh, let's be honest. To the outside world, Masons are, are, are Masons. Um, there, there, there are not different orders or, or degrees um, in in their minds. Um, no, I think it would be overly complicated to try and um, publicise ourselves, if you like, as Royal Arch Masons to the outside world. I would much prefer um, us to be more open about our Freemasonry in general, um, to be um, proud to be Freemasons, um, and to, you know, make sure the world understands that uh, we have a, a significant role to play in our communities and the social role to play in our communities, and indeed are playing in our communities, rather than to try and confuse anybody with you know, with something that that perhaps might look a, look a bit strange to uh, the outside world, um, because it's not something that that uh, means anything to anyone unless you're actually a mason. Absolutely, uh, Gareth. Uh, this is a lovely question, actually. So, well, I like to drop our, uh, our questions in as we're going, um, and this is wonderful. How do you balance being third grand principal with being the provincial grand Ma grandmaster of uh, in Wales? I mean, that's uh, two busy jobs you've got there. I wonder if that question has come from one of my members in South Wales. Would you like me to tell you who it is? No, no, I better not. There you go. Um, it's not a secret. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't pretend that it's not a stretch sometimes. It, it, it is. Um, they are two busy jobs. And uh, although I don't um, work full time anymore, um, I do have all my family commitments and I do do some uh, a little bit of work now and then. Um, so I balance it by um, making sure that I have a really good team around me um, as Provincial Grandmaster in South Wales, um, who are brilliant at um, doing all of the day-to-day -day stuff. And, uh, you know, I have an excellent deputy and assistants and a brilliant um, Provincial Grand Secretary and, and administrative office uh, that keep the province running um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and um, uh, that leaves me free to uh, do what I've got to do as as provincial grandmaster, but also to contribute on a on a broader and more national, and indeed international scale, um, as third grand principal. It, it it is actually sometimes a stretch though, and um, um, I hope my wife isn't listening because uh, <laughs> he, she would tell you it's uh, it's sometimes difficult. I, I think we would all understand that. Two, uh, two very busy jobs and we've just uh, scratched the surface of, uh, of what we're involved with. And, uh, and another question actually, um, going back to the history of uh, Chapter Royal Arch, uh, why Royal in Royal Arch? Oh, I don't know. Um, it, the, um, the actual wording in the um, uh, in the Book of Constitutions is the Holy Royal Arch, of course. We've tended to uh, not to use the words Holy Royal Arch uh, so much, um, uh, but we, we use the words Royal Arch uh, instead. The, the Arch, of course, refers to um, uh, the Arch in uh, the vaulted chamber of, uh, of King Solomon's temple. Um, the, uh, the three principles represent um, three individuals from uh, that period of, of the biblical history. And the 
the leader um, is, uh, is, is known as the, uh, the, the royal leader. Um, so um, the, the three uh, principles represent uh, the royal, the prophetical, uh, regal, prophetical, and sacerdotal or priestly offices. So the regal office um, is held by the, the leader of, of royal arts chapters. And, and I guess that's where the, the word royal comes from. Thank you, Gareth. And um, uh, this is from um, from Phil, Phil uh, Gazard. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your, uh, your name correctly. And it says, I'm joining Royal Arch in October, so that's very exciting. And uh, I wonder if you have any advice on how I should prepare. Phil, um, I'm delighted, first of all, that you are joining the Royal Arch. Um, uh, how you should prepare? Well, talk to your proposer and seconder um, but I would really counsel you not to read too much into it. Um, I described the, uh, uh, the Royal Arch meetings, the exaltation meeting, the, the meeting at which you are admitted into uh, your chapter as something which provides real impact, the wow factor, I think I, I called it earlier. Um, allow yourself that wow factor on the night. So I would I would suggest you don't prepare too much by reading into it uh, because it will then have more impact for you. I, I, I distinctly remember the night uh, when I was exalted. I had no idea uh, what the uh, internal um, furniture or, or, or symbolism of the chapter was going to look like. And you know when you first see it, um, it really does provide a, a huge amount of impact. So just let it happen. I'm sure you'll uh, you'll love it. Oh, great advice, Galvi. It really does make it more special, doesn't it? And um, and this is an interesting one again, isn't it? Why are certain craft officers also automatically the equivalent ranks within Royal Arch? Because uh, you, you do tend to find that, don't you? Um, well, in Grand Chapter. There are um, several that are, um, as it were, automatic um, offices because of their roles in Grand Lodge. Uh, that includes the Grand Master, of course, and the Programme Master. It also includes the Grand Secretary, who is uh, a scribe, as we call it, in, in, the, uh, in the Royal Arch. It also includes the Registrar and the Treasurer, uh, all of whom, if they are installed uh, first principles in in the Royal Arch automatically have those roles uh, in Grand Chapter. All of those um, roles are joint roles to further exemplify and demonstrate that indissoluble link um, between the craft and the Royal Arch. It's that link that I, I described earlier from the uh, the preliminary declaration in, in the Book of Constitutions. It's that link which says, yes, we're a separate order, the Royal Arch is a separate order from the craft, but it is indissolubly linked uh, to it. And you know, one of the things that exemplifies, characterizes, demonstrates that, that indissoluble link is the existence of these, these joint roles. You also find that um, for example, the Grand Director of Ceremonies is, is, uh, is the Grand Director of Ceremonies in the Craft and the Royal Art. It doesn't have to be, actually. The Book of Constitution doesn't require that. Uh, but we have further um, created a number of roles which are joint roles. Now let, let's talk about the um, let's talk about the history of Royal Arch compared to as it was to where it is now. How do you think it's changed over the years, Gareth? It's changed, well, we know that it changed in the early 2000s because the, um, the ritual was changed somewhat. Um, it's changed because we tend to share the work a lot more these days. Um, I don't think the meaning of the Royal Arch has changed at all uh, over that time. And most certainly, if any of our companions on the call this evening were to look at a, um, a ceremony from the early 19th century, they would certainly recognize it. Um, 
it's changed in that we have simply evolved slightly, I suppose, uh, over the years. We've tried to engage more people in delivering that ritual. Um, there are a number of chapters um, who dramatize uh, the, the ritual a bit more. They, they bring it to life a little bit more. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I applaud that, frankly. Anything which gets over to the candidate um, something more of the meaning of 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 the uh, of the ceremonial and and the the work that we're trying to do the better and um and let's let's talk about one of the uh, the things that we we often see uh, why do we wear uh well let's talk about the uh, the significance uh, the significance of the uh, three colors of the ribbon on the uh, provincial breast jewel uh, why are those colors there because a few people have asked that question Right, that's an interesting question. There's reference to this somewhere in the Book of Constitutions. The traditional colours of the Royal Arch are, of course, light blue, purple and red. Um, light blue, um, which represents the craft, red, which represents the Royal Arch, and purple, which represents uh, the union of those two colours. Those are the colours of the robes of the, the three principles, of course, and um, originally were the three colours on the uh, uh, on the ribbon uh, of a, a provincial officer. For many years now, and, and the Book of Constitution doesn't say why, but for many years now that purple was replaced by dark blue. Um, and I suspect it's something to do with the ease of production, uh, frankly. Uh, of uh, of producing the material in in dark blue rather than purple. So the the, the tricolor nature of the the ribbon is as a result of the three colors um, in in the royal arch. Uh, and I think the dark blue is probably just uh, something that's happened over many years. Gareth, brilliantly brilliantly explained. Um, time is drawing to a close. I can't believe how quickly. Uh, time has gone. It, we've we've got time for uh, for one more question, I think. Um, but before we do get to that question, I just wanted to thank you, Gareth, because as a, a Royal Arch member, uh, I've learned a lot from this. And uh, so, as a member, I've, I've walked away learning a lot. But I think, especially those who aren't members yet, uh, are being enthused to work to find out more after our conversation this evening. So, so thank you very much indeed. So, how can we encourage more brethren to join Royal Arch in the future? And how do you see Royal Arch in the next five years? Yeah, this is a really important question. And it's something that we discuss in Grand Chapter, and it's something we discuss with our provinces and districts a lot. Um, the answer is we don't know. We don't really know what works at the moment, and we need to find out what works better. And that's why the president of the uh, Committee of General Purposes has established a, a membership communications and working a membership working party under excellent companion uh, Patrick Penny to look at what works in provinces and districts well uh, so that we can spread that good practice elsewhere. We know that some provinces have over 50% of their craft masons in the Royal Arch. We know that some provinces have fewer than 30% of their members in the Royal Arch. And we need to find out exactly what it is that works well uh, to, to increase that, as we like to describe it, conversion rate from the craft to uh, the Royal Arch. Um, there are some things that we think work well. We think that uh, leadership in the craft and its encouragement of people to join the Royal Arch and its enthusiasm for the Royal Arch is important. We think that um, Lodge Royal Arch Liaison Officers are important in encouraging Lodge members to, to join the Royal Arch, but we need to know better precisely what it is uh, that makes some provinces do well and other provinces have challenges that they need to face. And that's what we propose to do over the next couple of years. Um, and um, I'm, for one, I'm looking forward hugely to being just a small part of that. It's exciting times ahead, Gareth. Absolutely, absolutely. Have you enjoyed yourself this evening? It's been fantastic. And I, can I just say, um, 
uh, I've talked about being wowed a number of times to see um, well over a thousand people um, uh, on the call this evening. I'd like to thank all of them for for, for joining us this evening. It's been uh, it's been a great privilege to uh, to be part of this, uh, and I hope that everybody's just got something out of it. Um, and if you haven't, get in touch with me, and uh, uh, we'll see what further we can we can say to convince you. Sir, you've certainly lived up to our expectations. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Third Grand Principal, most excellent companion, Gareth Jones, OB, for joining us this evening. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, companions, uh, the video uh, that you're witnessing right there will be available for you to watch again or for those who didn't get the opportunity to see it in the next few days. And um, please register for our next Solomon Live, which will be in the very capable hands of Deputy Grandmaster, Jonathan Spence and CEO of the uh, Masonic Charitable Foundation, Les Hutchinson, and our topic will be Freemasonry and charity, another one not to be missed. And as always, if you haven't done so already, why not? Please make sure you register for Solomon, solomon.ugle.org.uk, follow papers and videos, and of course, Solomon Lives. As uh, Gareth so beautifully said, it's been a brilliant to have you here tonight. And until our next happy meeting, we shall see you all very, very soon.